pour out. God, as you have poured in, Lord, that he would pour out, he would pour out of him tonight. Let the preacher come, the teacher. And we thank you for your word. God, we, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Paul thinks we're not good. 
God, you used to live there in the sinful nature. Remember that? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Let's never forget that. Let's never forget that. Now, he says, where you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. So he's saying you used to, you used to be led and guided by the, by the adversary, by the enemy. Now I got to thinking about, I got to praying about people in general. And you know how there's a stigmatism sometimes with people that when they are when there are believers, when they're believers, when they feel they're higher, thinking higher than something up. Sometimes people think of unbelievers as heathens, totally uh, apart from God, heathens, you know, all these things. But really, before I came to know the Lord, I wasn't really a bad person by society standards. I had, I had an understanding of that, that, that there was a God, that God did exist, but like many people, the concept of a relationship with God, not just God up here and me down here and God making sure everything's working out for me, but a relationship with Jesus that Jesus is walking alongside of me that was lost on me as a person. I didn't get that concept. And I think a lot of people who people say are heathens, but really are good people, that's the case. They don't get the concept that God loves them, number one. God wants to be with them, number two. And God can have a, you can have a full relationship with them. A loving relationship with God in their heart. And I think we need to think of it that way. Instead of condemning people for being unbelievers, that's why I say we have to never forget who, where we came from. Because if we forget where we came from, our mindset becomes... These people are bad, these people are heathen, these people are unbelievers, let's stand this far back. God doesn't want that. That's why he says, you once lived here, you once lived there. And God saw fit to save you. So why do you think you are more higher than they are? Such a wonderful thing to think about when we when we uh, mirror this against ourselves. Now, he says, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and the following of its desires and thoughts. All of us. He's not leaving himself out. All of us. The great apostle Paul is admitting, hey, I was where they are. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm the Apostle Paul. But yet, I was a sinner. I was disobedient. I was hostile to God. I was an enemy of God. And yet, He saw fit to save me. Now, we move on. He says here that... Uh, he says, uh, verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its de desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. By nature objects of wrath. I, I, a lot of this is just praying through this. I've not done any uh, commentary reading or any other thing like that. This is just Time spent with God through what God has shown, has shown me and showing us tonight. They were objects of wrath. Now, if you were a sinner, go back to me Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. If you go to Galatians chapter 5, we just did this two weeks ago. He says, he says in Galatians chapter 5, I believe it's chapter 5. 
when he talks about the, the, the acts of the sinful nature in uh, 19. He says, the acts of sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and, every, and, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Fits of rage. Sounds like wrath, doesn't it, on our part? Objects of wrath on our heart. And what, is, what are we when we are not following God? We are under God's wrath, right? We're under His wrath. So objects of wrath in twofold. We have the acts of the sinful nature working in our life, working in our heart, working in our soul. So we are objects of wrath in that we have the nature to be have rage in our life. How, 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 how many of us can say, I used to be like that? Maybe you didn't show it. Maybe you didn't slam things or throw things, but inside you you could easily. You know what I'm saying? You could easily just throttle somebody for looking at you wrong. Okay? So you're an object of wrath in that respect. As well as being under the wrath of God. Under the wrath of God. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. Oh, you know, I used to be, before I was a believer, I wasn't very much a raging person, but I used to be a slammer. <laughs> you know what a slammer is, right? I remember one time, I was telling myself, I remember one time I was at I was working at, a, at Lowe's and I was had to go to the bathroom. Nobody would answer their phone to, to let me go. And I was I was calling and calling and calling and I got into the place where I was upset and I took the handset because it was one of those old phones and I went, wham! And then I realized there's a camera there and there's a camera back there. And I went, oh no. And there's somebody in the office back there, right? Like, oh no. In trouble now. But I was a, I was had rage. It didn't show very much, but it was boiling away underneath. I was an object of wrath, as well as being under God's wrath. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing me out yes. of that. Do I still struggle with wrath, with rage? I think we all do, in some respect. We'd be lying if we said we didn't. We are angry. I mean, we're, anger is a normal emotion. It's how you deal with it. How things are, are dealt with in that respect. It's when we ask God and say, God, I need your help. I need your help. Right. We're going to throttle somebody. I need your help. <laughs> you know, we, we, need to, we need to be like that. We need to be like that. And it's, it, it, and it's a moment by moment situation sometimes. I understand that, and I think we all do. But we need to understand that we are no longer, as believers, children or objects of wrath. We have gone from being, from being uh, God's enemy to God's children, God's sons and daughters. Now, Says here, he says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Now, to fully understand the mercy and grace of God, we have to go back to the book of Revelation. So go to the book of Revelation. How many of us have ever seen or ever helped build a house before? What's the first thing you put in? Foundation. Foundation. Why? Because if you don't, you fall down. If you want to do it quick, you don't put the foundation in, but it'll slide right off, slide it off, so the, 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 the uprights right after it rains, right? Heard about that in the gospel. 
Go to Luke chapter 14 with me. Chapter 13, verse 8 and 9. It says, All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. Now this is talking about the enemy. Will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book of, in, in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain for the foundation of the world. Now we understand that in my Bible, lamb is, cap or lamb is capitalized. And we know in the Gospels that when Jesus was going down to be baptized by John, John declared him to be the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. So we understand that Jesus was the lamb. And we understand that before the foundation of the world. Meaning, well, what does it say in Genesis 1? Before God spoke, it was formless and void. So before it was spoken, when it was formless and void, God saw you, God saw me. God knew the very moment he wanted to create man to be a companion for him, he knew that man would turn away, man would blaspheme him, man would, would shake their fist at him, man would hate him, but yet, in eternity past, Jesus said, I will be their sacrifice to reconcile them back to you, even before the foundation. <coughs> I don't know about you, but if I had an opportunity to buy something and I knew it was not going to work, I wouldn't do it. If I had an opportunity to, to, to do something and I knew it was going to fail, I wouldn't do it. But yet God, in His richness, love, and mercy, even though we were going to fail, and we've all failed, he saw you. He saw you at your worst in your sin, and He saw you, and He sees you in the best in Him, and He said, I will be their sacrifice to reconcile Himself back to you. Isn't that great? Isn't that a wonderful thing? Now, let's go back down here. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2. When I'm doing these kinds of studies, when, when, I'm, when I'm in, when I'm focused in with God, and I'm reading and I'm praying, it's, I get excited. I mean, it's like the roof is shaking, and it's, uh, oh, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. He goes back, and he says, he says this, he says, uh, But because of his great mercy love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we're dead in our transgressions and sins, and by grace that you've been saved. But again, it is by grace that you've been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God raised us up into the heavenly realms with him. That was going to be, and that was, the plan from the beginning. Jesus said, I will be their sacrifice to reconcile them back to you. Jesus decided that on his own. It wasn't something God made him do. And then so God's plan was that we would be his children. We would be seated right next to Jesus. What does that tell me? That tells me we're joint heirs with Jesus. The inheritance that Jesus gets, it's ours too. 
because of the obedience of Jesus Christ and our obedience to Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to have the same blessing, the same uh, inheritance as Jesus. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Now, see this in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus in order that the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That's a blessing. When we need him, he will be there. When we need provision, he will provide. When we need protection, he will be our protector. When we need anything, he will be there. That's the riches that's, ex that's expressed in his kindness toward us. You know what the su su supremacy of Jesus is? I think you do. But if you think about the, the, the supremacy of Jesus, talks about it in, in I believe it's in uh, Corinthians or somewhere. I, I think it's Corinthians. First Corinthians. If you can think of anything that you never, might ever, ever need in your life, the worst thing or the best thing you'll ever need in your life, Jesus has it. Jesus can provide it. I'm not talking about cars and houses. I'm talking about when you're down and you are feel like you are lower than the dirt under your feet and you need to be brought up and restore, Jesus can do it. Jesus can do it. Because that's part of his kindness for us. And his supremacy. And his supremacy. Anything we can think of we would ever need in Christ, he can provide it. He can provide it. Because of his obedience, and because of our obedience to God in Christ. We talk about Galatians. All of this contingent upon being in Him and walking in Him. But He's done His part. And He is willing and able and available to give us anything we'll ever need. All we have to do is ask. And all we have to do is know what His will is. And that's goes by time spent with him. Now, let's go to verse uh, verse eight. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now. Have you ever heard someone talk about all the stuff they acquired in their life? When I was in business school and went on for management training, I was told that if I applied myself, I could get positions where I could make upwards of $150,000 a year. I could have all this huge house with nice cars and all of this stuff. That's all stuff. Can't take stuff with you because by grace you can say through faith. We talked about the grace of God, the grace of God that started in eternity past. But the faith had to take root. We talked about faith two weeks ago. What started the faith? The, the Old Testament law, right? Working in our life. To re help us to realize that we were sinners. We needed a Savior. Not somebody, not, not the man upstairs, not a higher power. We needed a Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. That's what it's all about. It's not a higher power. It's not a, another plane of existence. It is Jesus Christ. That's it. We're saved through faith. And when we came to that place, where we realize I need Jesus, we give our heart and life to Jesus, then that's where the faith starts to build. And know that it never comes from anything you've ever done. 
You cannot buy your way into heaven. You cannot earn your way into glory. You cannot earn a better place in heaven. Doesn't matter what you've done in your life. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what kind of car you drive, what kind of position you have in the community, how much money you have. All of that stuff is for naught when it comes to Jesus and His salvation. What it comes down to is your time spent with God. That's it. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. You cannot buy salvation. You cannot buy it. Jesus cannot be bought. He cannot be bought. Anything you've ever done that you think, well, well, you know, I'm doing all this stuff for the church. I must have a higher place in heaven. No, I'm sorry, that's not the case. The Bible actually says if you do that kind of stuff, you have your reward. Right now. That's not what it's about. It's not about what we do, how we do. It's about a relationship with Jesus. It says that his that redemption comes through his blood. And that's it. Redemption comes through his blood. It does not come through anything we do. Now you might say, wait a minute, hold on. It says faith without works is dead. No, no, no. The beginning of this all screwed up. Faith without works of dead means that the good works brings up, the faith brings about the good works. The good works do not bring about the faith. Okay? We have to understand that. Now, verse 10. I'm almost done. And it is. 10 to 8. Hey, look at that. Alright, now, verse 10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. I don't know if this sounds familiar. Did I show this two weeks ago? The scriptures two weeks ago? It sounds familiar because I studied it. I probably shared it in the video somewhere or I'll share it here. I don't know. But it, it, it is an understanding here that we are not our own. We cannot make ourselves at all. You are not a self-made person. It goes back to the whole thing about earning your salvation. It also speaks of someone telling you that you're junk, that you're unworthy, that you're worthless, more than unworthy, that you're worthless, that your life is trash. That would, that would, someone telling you that you need to tell them that Jesus is your Savior. And if He's not your Savior, you need to say, Jesus will be my Savior. Somebody that tells you you're trash, that you're not worth anything, you need to understand that that, that person cannot define you. You are God's workmanship. Not anyone else's. God made you. God knows your potential. God knows your worst. And God understands that. And God wants to be there to help you get through it. But you have to allow Him to help you get through it. You cannot just sit there and say, Oh, I hope, I hope, I hope. No, you have a knowledge and a surety that God is there if you are following Him. If you are following Him. You are God's workmanship. God's workmanship. Not your mom and dad. There's no generational curse here. There's no generational uh, ism curse, alcoholism, all that stuff. You're God's workmanship. When you get into that kind of stuff, then you're saying, well, God made junk. No, no, no. God won't make junk. He made you for purpose. He made you for promise. To be fulfilled in Him. Yes. Maybe we don't fully know that promise yet. But if we do, we better walk in it. We better walk in it. If you don't know it, you need to get 
deny your faith before God and ask Him to show you. Maybe He'll show you little snippets. But the snippets He shows you need to walk in those things. For to get the bigger picture of what He wants you to accomplish for Him. Understand it's all for Him. It's all for Him. Christian life is the hardest life you'll ever do. But it's the most, the most rewarding you'll ever have. I'm sure, you get a paycheck every week, working at a regular job, and then you have to take home your stresses of your work. But if you're working for God, He can take that stress from you and allow you to rest. He says, Come to me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see? Working for God has those perks. If we are working in a secular job or a Christian job, and we're not, and we're doing it without the without the understanding that God is our strength and God is our redeemer and God is our sustainer, and we're doing it heartily unto the Lord, as it says in the Bible, then we are living and working in an attitude of, I can't do it, it's not worth it, I don't want to do it anymore. Instead of, instead of understanding that God is at work. It's all for God, not for our comfort. Although that's kind of nice when it's comfortable. It's all for God. We're His workmanship. His work, but you understand that. And I want you to understand tonight. One thing I want you to get out of this last section is that you are worth something. Yes. You understand that? Look at me, all of you. Look at me. Everyone, look at my face. I tell my kids, look at my face. Everyone, look at my face. You are worth something to God more than you'll ever, ever, ever know until you see Him. You will fully understand that. You're His workmanship. Don't ever let anybody tell you any other way. Don't ever let anybody kick you down. You're His workmanship. He made you. He created you. I want to challenge you tonight. I want to challenge you to walk in that promise. Every day. Walk in that promise. We're going to have issues. We always have issues. We're going to have issues all the time. But walk in this promise. God made you. God has a purpose for your life. God wants you to be better than you are right now. Can we understand that? Can we, can we agree to do that? Can we agree to do that? It's hard sometimes. We're not used to doing it. But we have to have that kind of mindset. And it comes, it only comes when we fully understand it to a, to a portion of our understanding by spending time with God. We get little glimpses of how important we are. The full extent of the only over in heaven. But we get little glimpses when we spend time with Him. Like tonight, when we were all up here in the front. And we felt His presence. And we felt that love, and we felt that grace, and we felt all the things that God was doing. That's a little glimpse of how important each and every one of us is to Him. Don't ever let anyone take that from you. Don't ever let anyone take that from you. Because that is something that will sustain you the hardest times of your life. It really will. I hate to say it, but I'm a product of that. I understand that. I understand that. I have understood it through different stages in my life. That knowledge has sustained me through some of the hardest times in my life. And I'm not going to go into that now. The hardest times in my life, the promise and the knowledge that God was there really, sincerely saw me through. I'm telling you, it works. Because I've experienced it. I understand it. I know it. So that's my challenge. Walk in that promise. 
walk in that promise, when it's the darkest time in your life, look up. Look up. Don't walk around with your head down. Look up. Look up. So we call the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for these uh, precious, precious people. And I thank you for the opportunity to deliver your word. Lord, I ask that you would just be with us tonight. Help us to walk in the knowledge of your grace. Walk in the knowledge of our importance to you. And walk in the knowledge that we are your workmanship. We are not worthless. We are not unwanted. We are not anything that the enemy would throw at us. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we leave, I want to just do a little bit of business. Now, we understand, we you know, we see that there's a YouTube channel up with our video on. Now, there is a, a certain thing we have to understand that I have had to agree search and find out. But there is a new way that YouTube, um, there's a new algorithm for YouTube where they, the, what it recognizes to make it to where it goes farther than just this little area or the, or the people that watch it is we have to like the videos, we have to subscribe to the channel, we have to uh, share the videos, and if you want to, you have to comment on the videos. Any of you know, like, hey, did you shave your hair? Cut your hair. You know, good message, whatever. Uh, but you have to do those things in order because what 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 the what the goal is is to to go from the United States to other countries. You go around the globe. And that's how that, that program sees that people are watching that. And it sends it out to other other people that are of like mind or of like like content. Okay, so if you could do that for me, I would appreciate it. Yeah. You also have to do that bell for notification. Yes. Is there, is there a problem with people being unsubscribed to subscribers? Okay. Um, so the bell thing, you gotta do that too, you gotta really pay attention to that too. And, and, and this is something that we're all partners in ministry here, but this is like the bigger picture partnership kind of thing. This is things that are going maybe to areas that Pastor Ben has never been, and areas that maybe will never go, but these are going to those places if we put the effort in. And it's all about getting the word out, getting, getting the getting the things done that need to be done. So if you could do that for me, um, and for the church, not necessarily for me per se, but for the church and for uh, the, the ministry that's here, I would really appreciate it, and I know Pastor Ben would too. So, that's all I have. God bless you, and you all have a good evening.